You're listening to Skit Bash, part of Dungeons & Drama Nerds Rehearsal Reports. Welcome to Skip Bash, Dungeons and Drama Nerds monthly Patreon exclusive show. I'm Nick. Hello. Uh, before I introduce everyone else, I would just like to say, hey. Um, and I'm joined by Percy. Greetings. <laughs> Percy's very confused. I was trying to do the bit for My Fair Lady. Oh, I. I've listened to My Fair Lady as of today. I've never watched it. <laughs> Fascinating. Okay, so we've outed Percy as a Philistine. Uh, I'm also joined by Ben. Uh, fake Bernard Shaw fan here. <laughs> and Tess. Hi, y'all. <laughs> hello, hello. Uh, each episode, what we do here is roll on random tables for a well-known play and a tabletop role-playing game system, and then we try to kitbash them together. Uh, today, as I suggested, uh, if you've if you've seen the movie or the <laughs> The theatrical production. Uh, we're going to be putting together Lerner and Lowe's My Fair Lady, which is the same, which is adapted from George Bernard Shaw's Pygmalion, and we're going to be <laughs> mashing those up with Mike Pondsmith and Art Halsorian Games Cyberpunk Red. Sorry, uh, so Nick is laughing because I just understood what Nick was doing because I had only <laughs> seen it written. <laughs> it's it's fine it wasn't a very good joke it was <laughs> aggressive um, uh but we should we should talk about uh this play slash musical and game uh tess do you want to kick us off with a brief summary of the my fair lady pygmalion dyad yeah absolutely um so i read pygmalion most recently i've seen my fair lady a bunch of times but pygmalion's what i'm most familiar with and they're different in structure so i'm gonna go with pygmalion and you can throw things in periodically to you know say my fair lady stuff um so it's a it's a rainy day in london and a group of well-to-do truly truly pretentious people are trying to get a taxi and this flower girl eliza doolittle comes up to them and is trying to sell her wares trying to sell some flowers get some money and a man is taking notes on her we find out that that is henry higgins who is a linguist and also generally the worst um that's not part of the play it's just a fact um and he's really terrible to her everyone's like why don't you stop being such a dick to this girl and he's like i just think she should be better uh and then i think the next day technically um he and colonel pickering who's another linguist who's also there for that experience um are at henry higgins's house when eliza shows up and pickering and higgins make a bet that higgins can train eliza over the course of six weeks to be presentable as a duchess in polite company. We see in act three, this to clarify, uh, Eliza does agree to this um, though kind of begrudgingly Eliza's dad comes in and is like, you can't do this, but if you give me money, you can. Um, Alfred is in a few times. Alfred Doolittle is in a few times. We see Eliza try to pass for Posh in Act 3 at an at-home party at Henry's mother's house. That does not go well, um, but everyone thinks she's charming regardless. Then we finally see the aftermath of her passing for a duchess, um, which in the play, we actually do see that scene where she, you know, is in proper company. We actually see a couple different iterations of it in uh, My Fair Lady. Um, But in Pygmalion, we just see her getting home. And Pickering and Higgins are basically like, yep, our job is done. 
this kind of got boring for us by the end. So cool, we're done. And Eliza's like, hey, um, what about me? And Pickering's empathetic. Higgins is, as previously stated, the worst. Eliza runs away. She goes to Mrs. Higgins' house. And finally, Eliza and Higgins kind of have a confrontation when Higgins goes there the next day. And she's like, hey, um, are you going to stop being a dick? And he's like, well, if you notice, I'm a dick to everybody, (laughs) not just you. That's the difference between like good people and bad people is good people treat everybody the same. Bad people treat everybody differently based on status. I treat everybody the same. I just, you know, treat everyone badly. Um, and Eliza leaves to go to her dad's wedding, um, with the promise that she will never see him again. And depending on which iteration of the story you're telling, she comes back or doesn't. Um, there's a really iconic last line in My Fair Lady, which is, Eliza, where the devil are my slippers. And she comes back to, you know, give those to Higgins. And... Many productions have tried to remove how sexist that ending can be from this while still keeping, you know, the text intact. Um, I think that's pretty much everything in, like, the core story. My Fair Lady, as uh, Nick said, is a musical. So there's a lot of singing and there's dancing. And there's singing about dancing all night. And Freddy, who is kind of a love interest in Pygmalion, is a much bigger character in My Fair Lady. um, And has this whole beautiful solo being like, I love this girl. And they don't end up together because Eliza has feelings with a heavy asterisk for Higgins. Um... Yeah, and that's kind of the plot. Am I missing anything, folks? I don't think so. I will say, I just read Pygmalion for the first time today, after having been familiar with My Fair Lady for many, many years. Percy's giving me a shocked look. Now I'm the Philistine. (laughs) (laughs) No, I was going to say, what I I find fascinating uh, is that the, the kind of sexism of the ending is... Not kind of the 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 sexism of the ending of My Fair Lady is like an in, entirely an own goal on the part of the like book writers. And I was trying to trace it. And it's actually kind of complicated because it's like they base the book on the movie version of Pygmalion and then the you know movie version of the music. Whatever. Um, the point. Is... I mean, ultimately, it's just it's a musical based on Bernard Shaw's Pygmalion, and like it's sort of more complicated than that, but like not really. Like I think everyone knew that play. Not really. And Pygmalion is pretty is actually pretty cool, uh, if not necessarily effective, in that Eliza pretty clearly doesn't intend to come back. And in the version I read, which was published in 1912, there's a long epilogue, uh, as an afterword by Shaw that uh, suggests that perhaps uh, it's not the most effective ending theatrically because the last word is literally given to Higgins and he's like, eh, she'll be back. And apparently, unfortunately, people took the took Higgins very seriously there because there's a long afterword where he's like, people keep thinking, keep telling me that they're like so happy that they'll get back together. I must be clear, she is not going back to him. I think media <laughs> like, literacy gone. has always been in the toilet. I think it's pretty clear, like, you know, no, she's mad at him. Like, <laughs> He kind of ruined her life. Great, there's a great scene in the play where she gives him the business. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. It's actually kind of a couple. Act four and act five both have scenes where she's like chewing him out a little bit. Yeah, and then Mrs. Higgins, his mom, gives him the business. And Mm -hmm. it's pretty it's pretty great. Um, the only thing that I would say, only because I suspect it will come up later, or at least I intend to bring it up later, is that in the play, the sort of two, like, tests that Eliza has to, like, pass as a lady or whatever are, um, like, the Ainsford Hills family comes to Mrs. Higgins's like, visiting hours, and she joins them, and then there's, like, a big garden party with some, like, nobility. In the move or in the, in the musical, it's, um... Uh, they go to the racetrack. Um, so there, there's like a whole my favorite number. scene. 
yes. in that movie. Like they they go to the racetrack and then like when the horses start, uh, Eliza like reverts into like Cockney <laughs> like screaming for the horse that like yeah no it's fun it's very very funny, <laughs> and everyone's like what the scene. fuck. <laughs> It's a great scene. Um, so they go to the racetrack, and then there's uh, what's called the embassy ball. So there's like a big, like, much more of an event than a garden party. Um, so there's a the the stakes have been raised in the musical a little bit. I will say the other the the only other thing to add aside from like the music and those uh, stakes, the thing I was surprised to notice in reading Pygmalion that's absent from it that was added into the musical is any scenes of them actually doing the training mm-hmm. of Eliza. Mm-hmm. That's a big shift. There's, you know, there's songs, there's little scenes that kind of a uh, obnoxious atonal a thing I was doing is <laughs> at, at, or or was attempting, I should say, uh, was a, a reference to Eliza's like struggling with um uh getting the like her like vowels right, which is a whole sequence of scenes in the musical. And actually in the play, they actually talk about it her the opposite way. In the play, the most we hear about it is Pickering and uh and Higgins being like, Wow, she's so brilliant. She's got like the best ear of anyone we've ever worked with. So I mean I would argue that the rain in Spain is sort of a perfect song to to show that right like you know it's sort of her suddenly getting everything in a song and then it's lots of little linguistic jokes in the song and it's fun they're having fun and that's Mm. i think what's so fun about the musical is that like for most of it they're all having fun yeah it's a very light-hearted it's very light-hearted and a lot of them i mean you know all the songs from it right like if you are listening to this even if you have not seen my fair lady like i bet you know the rain in spain i bet you know i could have danced all night i bet you know on the street where you live uh, they, they, these are famous songs yeah. mm-hmm. wouldn't it be loverly get me to the church on time mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. i've got to custom to her face yeah no, um, i listened to it for the first time today and was like oh i yeah i've yeah yeah <laughs> For anybody who does not know the fun story about the movie, um, Julie Andrews did the part of Eliza on stage um, and then auditioned for the movie and got turned down for it because they wanted Audrey Hepburn uh, because she was prettier. Um, However, Audrey Hepburn couldn't sing, so uh, her voice was dubbed um, by the same woman who dubbed uh, later Natalie Wood in West Side Story. Um, and Deborah Kerr in The King and I, I just learned today. I didn't know that. Yeah. All all the same woman. <laughs> and then Julie Andrews and Audrey Hepburn were up against each other for the best Oscar. Julie Andrews for my uh, for Mary Poppins, Audrey Hepburn for My Fair Lady. And uh, Julie Andrews won and in her speech thanked the director of My Fair Lady, um, which is my level of petty. <laughs> Good for her. <laughs> ah, <yeah>. mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. Should we move on to Cyberpunk Red, or is there anything else people want to throw in there about Pig, Pig, Pig My Fair Lady? I have something to say, but I'll wait until our hot take section. More of a hot take than a plot summary. Okay. I mean, I have a suggestion for the, the people who made the Cyberpunk game. <laughs> Fascinating. All right. Uh, it's well, a video game. On. They made a major AAA video game out of this, out of this game system. <laughs> Start Keanu Reeves. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I heard that. Um, well, Cyberpunk Red, uh, the not the AAA video game, but the, uh, but the Art Halsorian Games' uh, latest iteration in their Cyberpunk universe is a, uh, a near-future Cyberpunk uh, dystopian tabletop role-playing game that we are mashing up uh, My Fair Lady and Pygmalion with. So in this universe, um, first, uh, there's a lot of reading to do um, (laughs) because there's a lot of history. And we were talking before we started recording about how this is one of the most kind of lore and history heavy uh, core rule books any of us have ever seen. There's a couple other things that come close, but this is way up there. Iconically, the major sort of apocalyptic event that sets off the cyberpunk red era of lore happened in 2023. Yes, yes. As and as we are recording this, it is the waning days of 2023, so it might still happen. Um, but it is set in a far future, or sorry, not near future, uh, canonically 2045. Uh, I mean, the first one was in 2020, <laughs> so uh, 
it already yes. happened. Yes, yeah. It, it The franchise dates back to the 1980s when they were setting it in the early 2000s in 2020, and then they've sort of progressed things steadily since then. Um, in this world, uh, everyone uses kind of uh, cyber technology, embedded cyberware, uh, and that term comes from a uh, from the word cybernetics, an old well, uh, like 1950s to 60s invented term uh, to refer to the interface of human beings and machines. Um, the punk part comes from the fact that this dystopian world is heavily influenced uh, by corporations. They have largely replaced governments in fact, although not necessarily in the letter of the law in many parts of the world. Um, and so much of this game is about uh, being the have-nots in a world of extreme inequality uh, where many people are forced to scrape by and uh, do illegal or questionably legal or quasi-legal things <clears throat> uh, to make a living in this world that's dominated by huge uh, bureaucratic and brutal corporations. The cyberpunk red setting specifically was interesting to me because I've only encountered cyberpunk in its sort of slightly earlier incarnations, and they've actually made a bunch of shifts to their uh, canonical world for that. Um, one of the big ones of which is that a lot of previous cyberpunk was about uh, uh, the the net uh, and sort of, and having net runners who could kind of. What's the word I'm looking for? Skedaddle seems wrong. <laughs> Zip, run, if you will, all over the net doing all sorts of things. Uh, and they've actually toned that back in Cyberpunk Red, which I found really interesting and a little confusing. Yeah, there's but, only one um, chapter about it. <laughs> what was that? There's only one whole chapter about it. That's true. Yes. But, it, but I, my best friend is a big Cyberpunk genre person. Um, and like his favorite book is William Gibson's Neuromancer, which is like widely considered like the earliest work in the cyberpunk genre. And it is all about just being in cyberspace on the net and encountering things on the net. And that is like the defining feature of what cyberpunk is. And now it has been <laughs> like restricted to one class in the cyberpunk red game. But anyway, carry on. Well, and, and sort of in, in the lore of the world, the reason for this is basically that in the, in the addition change events that they have interpolated it here, uh, basically the entire net got taken over by uh, hostile AI. So it quickly, it all got kind of cut off because people were just like, nope, that's, that's borked. No one can go there now. Uh, so everything in Cyberpunk Red specifically, all of the net stuff, you basically have to have local access to do, which is... Again, surprising to me, um, because I, th I think of cyberpunk as being very, yeah, Neuromancer, Snow Crash, like, worldwide the Matrix taken to the extreme. What was that? <laughs> the Matrix. Yes, The Matrix. It's something yes, that Matrix. literally everyone has seen. <laughs> I guess we could reference popular movies instead of mildly obscure instead science Instead of pretty novels. obscure science fiction novels. <laughs> Um, as far as the game itself goes, uh, Cyberpunk Red is... Blade Runner. <laughs> I could, I'm, I'll could keep going. I will. <laughs> um, as far as the game itself goes, Cyberpunk Red is uh, a pretty typical uh, kind of traditional tabletop role-playing game. You build a character who has one of ten roles, which are sort of lighter weight versions of classes that you might be familiar with from D&D &D or D20 games. Uh, and then each character gets to spend points to accrue different skills and uh abilities and starting equipment um and that that's pretty much it you roll d10s instead of d20s but other than that it is just kind of skill check resolutions all the way down from shooting a gun to r racing through the net to punching someone in the face uh to charming a crowd of people all of these are sort of resolved with the same central uh, resolution mechanic. Uh, that's anything I'm forgetting about Cyberpunk Red, gang? I feel it's important to name about Cyberpunk Red that um, 
it's it falls into a lot of the sort of like ableist pitfalls that a lot of like transhumanist works do like there are there's a lot um in the book dedicated to like different kinds of cyberware that you can uh, that your character can get sort of like integrated into their system and there's like all of these um like mental illnesses that you can get from replacing functional body parts with cybernetic enhancements or with um computers or cyberware or whatever um like there's a, a meter called humanity loss that sort of measures your disassociation from your physical body there's a disease called cyber psychosis where you like lose any sort of sympathy for humanity um and it is like better than previous games in this lineage but it's still not great um but which which is also to say there's a lot of mechanics that are surrounding like um both how you navigate the net if you're a net runner um and all of those sort of abilities and programs that you can have but also like in the physical world um what different cybernetic enhancements do and and what happens if you sort of get too many of them yeah thank you that's actually that's a really core part of the game that i did not get into <laughs> but yes the, this notion problematic as it is uh although like percy said they they like try to be better about it but root deep in the roots of the game are this notion of like trying to enhance yourself with cybernetics at the cost of your own humanity, whatever that means. They are... I mean, I would also argue that cyberpsychosis, as we have now learned, has a basis in reality if you've heard about the uh, Neuralink tests on monkeys uh, or apes uh, in which uh, they have implanted chips. This is Elon Musk's uh, put a chip in your brain so you can type on a computer by thinking <laughs> company. That's that's what it and they, you know they don't say that that's what it is, but like that's what they're actually trying to do. Um, uh, they're like you go you'll be connected to everything. You'll you'll be a living machine or shit like that. Um, and really they just you know did a bunch of unethical <laughs> experiments where they implanted chips in apes' brains, uh, who then did in fact like go completely insane. Like like did, like I'm not going to necessarily describe on this podcast the things that they did. Uh, because they're kind of disgusting. Uh, but what we see is like, oh, yes, if when you do that <laughs> to yourself, it is actually a form of torture. Like it is a form of, you know, if you're doing it to yourself, it's self-torture. If you're doing it to someone else, it's a form of torture. Um, and there are, you know, there are real world implants that work perfectly fine. Uh, you know, plenty of people have heart implants. Plenty of people have, you know, cybernetic limbs and things like that. Um but when we sort of get to the level of science fiction and of, uh, you know, you are becoming a machine. Part of you is a machine. The machine is part of your brain. I, I think what we are starting to see is, oh, yeah, no, that's like maybe like not a thing that we're capable of. Well, and I was so. going to say this edition of the game, which I, I haven't read previous editions, but my understanding is that this is a departure and a like response to some of those correct uh criticisms of the sort of cyber psychosis as it was previously presented makes very clear that like bo both mechanically and narratively they're like the things that push the loss of your humanity are replacements of things for purely that, that replacement of uh like functional parts of your body for like non-therapeutic purposes you know it's like it's not like any uh, thing it's specifically for like I want to be able to shoot bullets out of my arm as opposed to say the I have decided to electively chop my arm off that was just <laughs> a just... arm I here's what I'll say to transition this into hot takes because this is a hot take that I have which is actually that I think in thinking about putting these two things together there is something very interesting about the sort of transhumanist question of like loss of humanity associated with voluntarily adding more machines and computers to your physical body and the sort of thematic thing that Pygmalion and My Fair Lady are exploring that is about like uh, how consistent does your personhood stay when you change the way that you're presenting yourself to the world in this very sort of artificial way um, like I think that there is actually a lot of sort of synergy there that one might not mm -hmm. expect yeah, my whole core of, like, my pitch is entirely based on that. So, yeah, I'm with you there. Percy. I mean, I think our, our – can I just broach something that I think Please. we're all going to say? It's this This would just be about Eliza getting crumbed I, up. Actually, that's not my pitch, but 
Okay. Interesting. <laughs> uh, but like, that's, yes, that is the sort of one of the, I feel like two obvious things that you might do in this game system. Um, my pitch is rooted more in like, I'm cheating and I'm thinking also about the Pygmalion myth that Shaw's play adapts <clears throat> in which a sculptor fa like falls in love with his sculpture and then the sculpture comes to life. Um, like, I think it has to be about Higgins and Eliza, obviously. My pitch would be, what if Higgins is a is a net runner, and Eliza is a computer program, uh, that like because that takes human form. Oh, interesting. Okay. What is, and then is like, what is my purpose? <laughs> Could. That's fair. Okay. Wait. I I feel like I feel like before we dive into the weeds, I want to hear everybody's pitches yeah. and hot takes. Were there other hot takes people wanted to get out there? I we... have a. I've got a hot take. Um, I feel like the writers of Cyberpunk Red use a lot of real-world information to support problematic views. Um, there's a whole section where they're talking about dissociation. It's on page 230, if you all have the book in front of you. Oh, my God. Um, where they uh, actively quote, like... Not WebMD, but uh, Mayo Clinic. According to the Mayo Clinic, mm -hmm. dissociation is a mental process. Yeah, of, yeah, and they're like, well, clearly this is what this means, so we can use it this way. And I'm like, eh, I mean, maybe not. Um, and there's some stuff about gender. Not a lot of stuff about gender, but like there is a understanding with the way this, uh, the text is written that gender is super flexible and such. And yet in the um, internal cyberware uh, like list, they list a Midnight Lady sexual implant um, and Mr. Stud sexual implant, um, which uh, are clearly implied to be breast implants and um, a uh, penile. Rebel yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was trying so hard to figure out a good way to say that. And those are both the robo hogs. Super. If anyone's listened to mm -hmm. Neo Scum, very bio essential. They're both. <laughs> yep. Uh, so, I feel like, based on I, I've only read part of a previous edition, um, that was way more problematic than this one, but I feel like they corrected on the most surface level possible. They also do. I, a I, they also do a funny thing with like weird selective references to real world history and cultures that they then just sort of like let go of when it's no longer convenient to them. <laughs> I mean, I think the game to talking sorry the video game uh, Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven, which was the it's that was released uh, in twenty twenty I think, um, and was hotly anticipated for a long time. Same studio that did the Witcher games. Um, a Polish studio called CD Project Red, um, and they uh, that game is also sort of criticized for essentially like you know kind of trying and not really getting mm -hmm. there. Like I think uh, the the way the game deals with gender in particular is like essentially they sort of said in all their promo materials and did in the character creation um, part of the game like you can kind of be whatever you want. Um, and then essentially what the actual mechanic of gender in the game is, is you're picking a voice actor. <laughs> like that's, there's two voice actors and they're both playing the character of the same name, V. And basically just whoever you pick, that's like the gender you are. You are man V or you are woman V. And there are different uh, romantic options in the game based on that. And then like, otherwise when you pause, you just see a, whatever character you created. Um, they also had like genital mechanics, like you could pick a hog, and that had no bearing on anything. And so it seems like they really wanted to create a game where it's like you can do whatever you want. And then they were like putting it onto the uh, a game where you have two options, basically, mm -hmm. rather than just like you know, you. I think uh, a game like uh, Fable to talk about a game that was also uh, hotly hated for <laughs> trying saying it could do more than it could. That game actually does pretty well in that, like, you can do whatever you want, and what you don't do is what your character is mm -hmm. not. 
rather than what's being locked off for you based on a thing you picked yeah. in the menu. I would like to propose, wholly unrelated to anything in cyberpunk, um, that Ben refers to penises by a different name every time he refers to them. <laughs> Perfect. Um, cause every time? Okay, yeah, yeah, you got it. We've got Hog and Robocock so far, and I'm really curious how many we can get. <laughs> I'll, I'll, keep, I'll keep working on it. <laughs> I'll keep working on it. <laughs> I, I will say, uh, and, and this is... Um, this is not a hot take, but ju- just to just to throw it out there, I I absolutely agree that I think this game could be described as uh, 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 trying with good intentions and not quite getting all the way there. I I also I don't know. I think part of the thing that is always tricky about games like this is with those um, kind of sexual uh, cyberware that you mentioned, Tess. I very much read those as. It, as a kind of in-world example of like, oh, this is like, uh, you know. It's gender affirming. <laughs> no, well, no, see, the reverse. Like, I was like, this is this is meant to be an example of like upselling men, you know, up, upselling cis men. Like, you need a better penis. Buy a Mr. Stud, whatever, whatever. Um I guess, true, admittedly, in a sort of uh, future dystopia, which this does take place in, yeah, no, you would just have, like, gender-based sexual robot uh, dong-altering <laughs> menus, and it's, like, very, like, completely binary. It, like, isn't really based on anything. It's, like, entirely, like, 1970s aesthetics. Uh, so, I mean, it is, it's dystopian, but I don't think that that, I don't think that was intentionally dystopian. I think it just is yeah, accidentally okay. dystopian. Maybe I'm being too generous, too. Mike Pondsmith. Uh, I mean, it's a problem that I see in our world right now, too. Um, I'm a trans woman and uh, shopping for sex toys. It's like anything that revolves penile stimulation. It's like, this is for men, capital men on the, like, the box. And I'm like, um, no, it's not. Um I actually, I spent a really long time a couple of weeks ago trying to find, like, gender-affirming sex toys. Um, uh, and, you know, it's really hard to. Yeah. Um, yeah they make you go to the blue section <laughs> of the website, and it's like, <laughs> why it gotta mm-hmm. be blue? Uh, Cute Little Fuckers is the most um, gender-affirming uh, sex toy company I found right now. Cute Little Fuckers and um, Shop NB are the two... Uh, gender good good at talking about gender sex toy companies that I am aware of I have not seen Shop NB so I will absolutely add that to my list anyway. I love that the skip bash includes gender affirming sex toy recommendation sex toy company recommendations that's what happens that when, you put two, when you get two trans people together <laughs> <laughs> I think that's also a necessary part of cyberpunk though, right? Like I think a lot of cyberpunk narratives have in them, I think more commonly than other narratives, um sort of an exploration of what future sex would be. Uh you know, sex as like I am doing this in like full VR. I am <laughs> someone else. <laughs> I am, like, not in the room with someone I'm having sex with, but I'm, like, feel like I am. These are things that actually do sort of exist today, too, but not to, like, a holodeck degree. And I think this sort of does, like, the holodeck style thing. Well, and I think there's, like, a... The vibe of cyberpunk as depicted in this particular game's, like, lore, they talk about it all the time. It's very, like, grimdark, like, you're you're a sexy criminal, and, like, you do a lot of drugs, and you fuck a lot of people and you're you don't give a fuck about anything like it's very like you they also make you do drugs like if you're crumbed up you have yeah. to do a bunch of drugs it's like to you not, it's like, like you die. have no choice you are cool and hot <laughs> <laughs> and you're doing crimes unless and this is i mean you're still doing crimes but the weirdest thing to me is that one of the 10 roles you can be is it's a drug. cop <laughs> Oh, and a cop. Actually, yes, yeah. both of these things. I'm like, this seems like somebody missed a memo. Like, why can you be a, why are two, why is one fifth of the possible character roles, like corporate executives and, and lawmen? <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, I'm going to say something, you know, we famously, uh, CEOs and police never do anything immoral. Like they, everything mm-hmm. they do is like really above board. 
uh, they're like known for their morality and like more being more moral no, than look, other people. I know, I get it. I <laughs> I understand it. It just seems like that. I, it seems like there's so many narratives that would fit cleanly and easily into the cyberpunk sort of framework. Even before you introduce that, that like this, there was no other design space to be explored. <laughs> But that's neither here nor there. It's it's an interesting inclusion that I, I feel. Actually, I like it. I personally like it a lot because it is sort of saying like, you know, actually, like sometimes your job is a class, right? Like a class in the way that a game treats a class uh, and like having like, you know, social power, or financial power is an important mm -hmm. power in a game. And I think in this game, but also a lot of other uh, cyberpunk style games, money is like as important mm, as hit yes. points right <laughs> like which parallels pretty nicely with the world of Pig pygmalion and my fair lady if you at least if you look at like mm -hmm. alfred doolittle's like storyline um yeah although admittedly i'm not sort of in touch enough with the specificities of the class dynamics of 1800s london 1800s london early 1900s london late late 1800s late 1800s like london 80s or 90s to have a real sense of like like he's like so sad about joining the middle class and i'm like that sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's that's meant to be comical, I think. But that is a good. I want I want to swing us back into pitches for how we. You would don't want us to keep talking bash. about hogs. <laughs> I mean, listen, it can be it can be hogs all the way down uh, if we want. We'll get some more tally whackers in there. I, I will say uh, something to relate them. Also, is that the way that Alfred Doolittle sort of changes classes from being, you know, a, a very, very poor man to becoming quote unquote middle class. Um, and also American middle class is a notably notable thing. Um, like the United, the United Kingdom never had a bourgeois revolution. So like they even today really still kind of have a completely like feudal arist aristocratic class system. And so like part of the dynamics of this play and musical is that even though, you know, the Doolittles are being quote unquote uplifted to a different class, they are never going to be able to be the same class as the people who are doing that quote unquote mm -hmm. uplifting. Like the people who are doing that uplifting are the ruling class and they are actually like aristocrats, titled people. Um, and you that, that, like you don't move that like that's that's a ceiling that you can't move beyond in that culture. Um and he is, is, I mean, I think that's one of the things that uh, Eliza hits near the end of it is, oh, I've hit the ceiling. I've gone as far up as I can. And actually, now I have none of my old friends and I can't actually be friends with these new people. They were pretending I was something more than I was to them. And now I'm not. And I think in cyberpunk, the same thing happens. Like if you're playing this game, you're always going to be in debt. And I, that's one of the main mechanics of this game is that you are in debt. What you are doing is chroming yourself up, buying more gear, buying more like services and apps and things that are going to make you be able to make more money to pay off the debt that you have accrued by doing all of that. And so sort of by design, you are not, you cannot be like of the ruling class in this cyberpunk world. Ben, do you want to give us your pitch for the the kit bash of these two worlds absolutely so i mean i think and i mean i'm sort of thinking of this as like what if uh what if they did a different plot for cyberpunk 2077 because <laughs> the cyberpunk 20, 2077 plot is essentially you play v uh a like you know cool cyberpunk person and v uh through you know doing a bunch of jobs getting uh sort of thrust into the world against their will eventually comes uh, into possession of a chip that they have to put into their head. And uh, the chip contains the personality of a guy named Johnny Silverhand, long dead. But basically, Johnny Silverhand's brain is being uploaded into your body, and you have to undo that somehow. And that's sort of the, the big sort of plot of the game is like, oh, my brain's being wiped and replaced with the guy. <laughs> and you hallucinate this guy. This guy's played by Keanu Reeves. Uh, you know, fa famous actor from uh, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, <laughs> and only no that other films uh, from from Pennsylvania Shakespeare festivals. <laughs> and um, so, I think rather than that, you get sort of a plot where it is you are Eliza Doolittle, a normal civilian, and you essentially get uh, caught up in some sort of cyberpunk job. 
and Henry Higgins and his crew basically uh, start the process of like bringing you into their world, chroming you up. And uh, you can't get out of it. Like it, the only thing you can do is to sort of follow them and uh, keep taking the things that they're offering you because these people have more money and power than you could dream of. And even if you wanted to get out, you can't because now you're trapped in that system. So I think that's sort of the like, that's the premise that I find interesting. And, you know, thinking about a, a, a single player uh, role playing game uh, type video game, like a CRPG video game, like, yeah, no, you're you're going to have to make a lot of choices, but the choices are going to lead you down sort of like a, what you think is a branching path that sort of ends in the like, are you going to stay with Henry Higgins or not? <laughs> and that's sort of the final the final thing. And, it, it, you know, it makes me think of also uh, like there's a couple of Shakespeare plays. Uh, what is it? Winter's Tale, A Measure for Measure that end with like a woman being like betrothed to a man who like she should all for all intents and purposes completely despise and the thing about it is the way they're written and i think it's not intentional i think they're just sort of written that way well you can't write someone saying oh yeah i'm gonna go against everything i did in this whole play uh and make it work so they just kind of don't say anything that sort of leaves it open and a lot of people do those both of those plays i mean you can do big Malian and my fair lady if you do one of them to make a different choice to sort of make the like, no, I'm leaving <laughs> or like, no, I'm not. Yeah. I think that's very, very interesting. Okay. So we've got the sort of solo version of Henry of you are Eliza. Henry Higgins is being uploaded into you or Henry Higgins is like, has brought you into yes. his crew basically. Yeah. And then we've got Percy's uh, <laughs> proposal of Henry Higgins as net runner <laughs> with a, Eliza as computer program. Uh, Tess, do you want to give us your pitch? Yeah. So mine is actually kind of a blend of the two. Um, yes. uh, so for me, the big piece I was struggling with is, is this just about presentation? Is it just about like, I'm going to be training Eliza to present as an exec or present as, you know, a different class than she is? Um, or is it, you know, again, as Ben mentioned, like the modding, the cybering of the body? Um, and I was kind of leaning into the idea of it still being presentational, um, which makes Eliza fit really well in the Rocker Boy class, um, which is all about like, performing and convincing people of things using your words it is typically referring to a musician um which i mean i, I guess hypothetically if you want to make this my fair lady as opposed to pygmalion it she could still be a musician um we can we can go full confessions of a teenage drama queen on this um which has a lot of references to pygmalion in it um if anyone is familiar with the uh, classic Lindsay Lohan film, it's a Confessions of a Teenage Drama Queen, it's a great movie. It is Pygmalion. Oh, yeah. It is Pygmalion. <laughs> and they perform Pygmalion in it, except it's also a musical with a rock number at the end. Pop rock. It slaps. The um, song is good. Anyway. So good. Um, and so my, my pitch was essentially Higgins and Pickering hire on this lower class rocker B to make a team to infiltrate upper class society. I was toying with the idea of why, what that bet is. And I don't think it's actually a bet in this world because elevating social status doesn't feel like the stakes are high enough. Um, we talk about Pygmalion to My Fair Lady, seeing this action happen on stage raises the stakes going from, you know, the garden party to the ball raises the stakes. I think to adapt it even further, we have to make the stakes even bigger. So I think you have to get rid of the bet completely and make it, you know, Eliza's being modded both physically and in the way that she speaks, in the way that she presents, being trained to perform as somebody else for some sort of heist or job. Um, and 
it's interesting because Cyberpunk Red actually starts one of the first things you see is like a three page glossary of street slang. And reading it, I was like, huh, we really do start being like, language is really important in this, but this is all stuff that you'd be talking about as a criminal on the street. Um, So in my mind, it almost gets to like Blades in the Dark level in my uh, pitch for this game. Blades in the Dark level of like, you are making a crew. Um, So I had Higgins as a med tech who is literally physically modding Eliza, um, who is a rocker boy, and Pickering as an exec who can, like, get them the access they need. Um, Does Pickering work like a megacorp? That's what I was thinking, is, like, Pickering is basically being like, hey, I can't steal this money because, or steal this tech, whatever they're stealing, because obviously I work here. But if Eliza is able to pass for an exec enough to get inside... She can steal it. It's what happens if um, Pygmalion, uh, Cyberpunk Red, and, like, Ocean's Eleven crash together. Kind of like the idea of, like, a, an, an, a Final Fantasy character. Like, Eliza is a Final Fantasy character, like, Onion Knight-style person who can change her job. <laughs> and being able to be all the classes in this game, or the roles in this game. Because it's like, oh, yeah, no, you're, she's not. She's not uh, singularly focused on net running. She could do it all. I also or like at least pretend. sort of like, because reading the handbook, I forget. Like, I think in my brain, cyberpunk is like a science fiction game and that's what it's classified as. But really, it's a crime game. Like, it's a game about criminals and doing crimes. And the genre is the crime genre. Yeah, <laughs> yeah very much so, I feel like. At least I, I haven't played it, but from reading the book, that's what it feels like to me. I don't think there's a single cyberpunk story that isn't really about a crew of outlaws doing something illegal. And, you know, not all, it's not always for money. It's often to, like, you know, destroy a government or to, like, save or someone. Because, uh, right. or because they're being blackmailed by a, by a corporation, which is the case in uh, Neuromancer. Yeah. And or, in, you know, and in you ax- Pygmalion game. <laughs> <laughs> you accidentally do something you didn't realize was illegal, and now you're like, well, I have to you know protect myself and protecting myself ends up being taking down the system Mm -hmm. yeah um which i think yeah it's been a while since i saw blade runner but i'm pretty sure that that's like how blade runner starts it's been a while though i know there are robots and not robots (laughs) i mean from the from the perspective of replicants Mm -hmm. yes because they are basically like oh no we're just actually people but we don't have any rights at all so like the ones who escape are essentially like (laughs) you know both trying to pass and uh to a degree failing but also you know they had to get into crime to do it in the first place to not you know basically just be incinerated Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. nick what's your pitch Sorry, now I'm like pouring through the book. Um, Yeah, no, I I love Tess's uh, suggestion, and my pitch was very similar to that. Yeah, uh, I also was like, okay, I want to make a sort of like team of people uh, that are Pygmalion in 2045, uh, Cyberpunk Red. And I think, so for me, I also... um, I, I want it to be Pygmalion specifically more so than My Fair Lady because uh, there is something about the way that Pygmalion ends. And again, not really technically in the play itself, but in Shaw's like extremely long winded because it's Shaw afterward to the play. Uh, he's like, Eliza and Higgins probably like continue to have a relationship and like continue to you know n- know each other in some way, but they are never like really on good terms. That feels like something that Cyberpunk very much could sustain. Of like, ah yes, we if you got to this point in the narrative, the sort of like, I guess we work together and we like know each other very well. Also, we don't really like each other. <laughs> <laughs> but like but like that feels appropriate to the world so yeah i was going to propose eliza also as a rocker bee um and then i was well i was just looking through it to figure out i was debating back and forth i feel like the the player characters to me are eliza higgins pickering and then i was going back and forth between uh alfred doolittle or uh 
left field proposal or Mrs. Pierce. That's amazing. <laughs> a fourth character. Um, and I was going to say, I think, I, I, I think my proposal would be Eliza as a rocker bee, um, who has been like taken in uh, by Pickering and Higgins Pickering as a solo um, because he is a British Imperial officer who's just come back from India. And I, uh, yeah. I'm just thinking about that. <laughs> uh, and then I was going to propose Mrs. Pierce as a fixer, um, mostly because I like Mrs. Pierce and I want her to have fun. <laughs> and that role seems fun to me. And Higgins, I was going back and forth between whether Higgins could be an exec or I like the proposal of MedTech. I was also just looking at the um, the the t- the non med tech role, which I feel like would give him a little bit more of a like specifically cyberware slant. Um, but I I'm not sure I know the game mechanics well enough to. Do do we feel like Henry Higgins being a linguist in the way that he is in Pygmalion and in the way that he sort of transforms Eliza Doolittle through that science? Do we feel like that is a little bit science fiction? Like, so like, would it, would it track to being a netrunner? I have him as a netrunner in my sort of configuration. It's like science fiction to the degree that like Sherlock Holmes is like, you know, various forensic science things, including phrenology, uh, are like also science fiction. Like and, you know, some of them are real. Uh, some of them are just him being like really observant. And some of them are like he uses pseudoscience to figure something out. And like that's not real, but it's in the book. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. But maybe a Netrunner. The th- the, all of the Netrunner examples and like stuff in the book seem very focused on like the equivalent of breaking and entering to me yeah it like, is. It's, I guess it's doing that to steal data right and i guess i guess the thing for me and i'm curious what it feels like every, it, it is to everybody else is i'm like okay the obvious this is i think the kind of obvious approach but the sort of thematic of transformation is you know the linguistics in 1890 or the cyberware in 2045 which is why in my mind it's like higgins it whatever the situation is higgins is the like supplier of eliza's cyberware or but 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 i think especially what percy suggested about like maybe higgins is a net runner and eliza is actually entirely artificial or constructed is also really interesting yeah and i love that because it can bring us back it can bring us all the way back around to eliza the first chatbot <laughs> um, oh my god oh uh, yeah I is that a direct reference is. i should it, the the chatbot okay. naming i believe it is yeah i think yeah eliza the chatbot was named after eliza from pygmalion this is nixon my, my half buddy. memories yeah. of reading hamlet on the hollow deck <laughs> <laughs> yes <That's great. laughs> Did you read it in the original thing on? <laughs> mm, um, I should watch Star Trek. I, I know that I would like it. Anyway. It's a line from Star Trek 6. I, it's also the name of a very good book by Janet Murray that I would highly recommend to any theater artists who also are interested in game studies. Um, however. It's very good. Um, it's dated because it's from 1996 or something. She does a good, good job in the 2016 edition of writing little prefaces that are like, here's how this panned out. <laughs> Oh, I need to look that up. I haven't. I didn't know there was a an updated edition. Anyway, I mean, it's like reading any Ray Kurzweil book where it's like he's saying, "In the next ten years, <laughs> this is going to happen," and then ten years later, like one of the five things he said has sort of happened. And it's like, <laughs> like how could you have known? But also, bold a bold strategy. <laughs> he's intensely prescient, and he's wrong most of the time. Uh, in any case. I yeah, I'm interested in the idea of Eliza as a as an artificial thing, perhaps based on a real person, like illegally or something. Like I'm in, I'm interested in the artificiality of it, but I also really like um Tess and Ben's idea of like um I like both the sort of the solo and the group version of like Higgins Higgins is like modding this girl like that feels more true to the play like i'm do i my version is an adaptation of the myth that is different than george bernard shaw's pygnalian and i own that other things people liked or resonated with them or hated well i guess I, you can only say i, I, I i'm open work. to hate so you can tell me if you hated mine i won't speak for anyone else 
Nick, I also went back and forth on if there are other player characters. Um, Mm -hmm. I have a whole list of, like, potential classes. And I also, like, went through and was like, okay, how would you, like, stat these people out if they were classes? Um, And I came up with, uh, weirdly, Clara, I thought, could be a really fun, like, not full-time player character, but, like, you know, joining in for a one-off kind of player character. Um, as the media. Mm. Oh, nice. I like that. Yeah, that's a cool. I like that one. Because she's so status driven. Um, and I thought that would be really interesting. I had Pierce as a fixer as well. Um, I also had Albert as a fixer, um, specifically Mm. for the like information brokering piece of it. Mm -hmm. Um, I thought that was a, he deals so much in Pygmalion with like, oh, I knew this piece of information about Eliza because I talked to somebody who told me this piece of information and I, you know, said the right thing to the right people to get the right door open. Um, and is inherently just kind of charming in a way that I think really lends to deal-making and information brokering. Um but yeah, I would say, like, for me, I love the idea of having Pierce as a full-time player character in this, you know, campaign of things. Is, Fre- um, is Freddy a med tech? Freddy's not really a character in the Shaw version. I'm sure he's not really in the Shaw version at all. I was, I was going to say, the other one who we, we haven't mentioned, who I find interesting... He's not that important in the musical. He just has one of the best yeah, songs. Yeah, That's right. true. He's, he's a minor character is one good song in the musical. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the probably the best song in the musical. Yeah, like... Truly, one of my favorite stories is um, the theater that I worked at uh, in D.C., only theater center, did it right before I like started working there and like I came in for the very tail end of it and the actor who played Freddy is like I had a great time I was in the opening scene I slept till the beginning of act two I came in (laughs) did three scenes sang a great song and then went back to sleep and I was like yeah no that's that is exactly Freddy Freddy is the princess track of my fair lady (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah yeah I I was about to say that I mean that's structurally what his mm-hmm. character is too. Like I that's true. That's very true. Another slightly left field proposal, but you know who's a pretty major character in the original and I don't think shows up in the musical. I don't remember her in the musical, but I don't have time to go check. Is Henry Higgins' mom. Yeah, Henry Higgins' She's mom in the musical. In... <laughs> she is in the musical? Okay, mm-hmm. I don't remember. Well, She's typically was... played by the same actor as Mrs. Pierce. Um <sighs> it's typically a split track. Um She's not as major a character, but she is in it. Well, for those who haven't read Pygmalion, she's a pretty substantial character in Pygmalion, actually. Mm-hmm. I mean, she's in two out of the five acts, which is more than most people. And her scene um, where she gives everyone, but Henry and Eliza, yeah. the business is pretty great, where she's like, I'm not calling Eliza downstairs until you apologize. Yeah, she fucking rules. So what if, what if it's uh, Mrs. Higgins as an exec? And then Henry as either a tech or a med tech or something like that. That kind of rules. I love Mrs. Higgins as an exec. Yeah, I well, and I like I like the idea of Henry Higgins as this like kind of fuckboy son who's just like off doing his cyber cyberware shit in the garage, and she's like, whatever, I'm busy, <laughs> I'm busy working my entire social network to make things happen. I mean, he's also, like, clearly a corpo, right? Like, he is, he has to be from the, like, power yes. structure. Because that's how the whole story is, is that this guy with a lot of power decides to, on a whim, help, scare quotes. I also really like it. the idea of translating, because, like, we've all clearly sort of are in agreement about the fact that we're taking the story of Pygmalion and putting it, setting it in the future, in the world of cyberpunk, for sure. And I like the idea of translating, like, English, like, old money families into mega corporations like i think that that is a good Mm -hmm. translation well and you know when you think about it you think about old money families uh like i don't know elon musk's (laughs) it's this is and you know even like you think of bill gates you think of a lot of these people these silicon valley people who pretend they're not not money no they're from 
ludicrous money. And that's exactly the kind of people who are going to become the like biggest ruling class if this kind of thing happens. When Percy, it's like the Musk Habsburg family, right? Like, <laughs> oh my God. And they will be just as inbred. I mean, you know, thinking of linguists, I'm, I'm thinking of the, you know, the most famous linguist of the world today is probably Noam Chomsky. And, you know, would Henry Higgins also be an Epstein associate? Probably. <laughs> That's the title of this episode. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, put it right out there. <laughs> Uh, no, I was going to say, yeah, no, I, the thing, the thing that I like about it is, yes, it does. I think, I think we need him to have access to that, like, major power structure. Um, and yet also not be very good at it. I like it. making him and, kind of a loser. <laughs> right. Well, like, he is, my favorite part of the play is that George Bernard Shaw literally describes him as a giant baby. <laughs> like, that's not, I, I'm using the word literally advisedly here. There is a stage direction where he says something like, were it not for the fact that he is obviously a 40-year-old man, you might mistake his behavior for that of a baby. <laughs> so, I love Shaw. So that's why I was, that's why I was like, I, I, like he, he needs to have access to the power structure, but I don't think he can be an exec in terms of like game mechanics because that is all about like being good at working people and like having a team and like playing the power structures. And Henry Hickens is demonstrably terrible at that. But if his mom is the exec, then like she can do that while he uses all of her like power and money to go fuck around with his uh, obsession and ruin people's lives, which is what he does in the show. I had a, question thought that literally just came to me so it's not anything that i've like lingered on but henry higgins in the play doesn't really have like a tragic backstory he kind of just sucks um his mom was very wealthy he grew up very wealthy and then he was like i'm gonna do this you know kind of obscure task of being a linguistics professor and then you know get a chip on my shoulder about it and then you know fuck everyone over but there is that piece of admittedly problematic world building in cyberpunk red of like the more you mod yourself the less you care about people Mm. and i'm like is there something to that of like henry higgins doesn't actually have the capacity for empathy because if his mom is an exact he's got access to so much money and a lot of the mods in like the like seven pages of mods charts deal with like being able to read lips being able to hear things from really like far distance if he has modded himself out so intensely to be the world's best linguist he probably can't actually give a shit about eliza that's very good i love that I love that notion. It it gives Higgins some sort of like likability factor of the man obsessed to the point of losing his humanity. Where in, again, Pygmalion, he's just a giant baby. Yeah. But I think that is something that's very true of the character in the, in Pygmalion too, is like, it's, Shaw says whether you agree with this or not, but in the stage directions, he's like, Henry Higgins isn't like deliberately malicious or cruel or whatever. He's just so wrapped up in he's he's the uh, Jurassic Park line of like he's so wrapped up in whether he can do this thing that he absolutely doesn't consider whether it's a good thing to do or what it's going to do to Eliza or like her feelings about the whole thing. He's just totally zeroed in on uh, his task. And I love representing that with like if we were starting a new campaign with this, it'd be like, all right, Henry Higgins gets to start out with like a shit ton of cyberware just to like push, push his humanity score lower or humanity and empathy are both their, their related scores. I don't remember what the calculation is, but I do like the, both of them get pushed down. I do like the element of Tess and Ben's pitches though, that Henry Higgins is not a player character. Mm. Like something about that is, is enticing to me. Um, either in the sort of solo version that Ben has proposed or in the, like, a crew of people who do not appear in the original Pygmalion version that Tess has proposed. Although perhaps it is, like, Clara and Mrs. Pierce or whoever. 
Well, I, th- I was surprised nobody quite suggested this. I don't think, uh, unless I unless I misunderstood. But I was going to say, I do think there's also a version of this you could do where Henry Higgins is straight up the like nemesis or quasi nemesis. Uh, I think that's kind of what Ben proposed. <laughs> Yeah, no, you're you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that is that is right. Yeah, just an internal one. <laughs> I mean, I think he kind of has to be the antagonist. I think in the world as established in Pygmalion, he's our antagonistic force. Um, assuming that Eliza is your protagonist, but he almost feels like so single-minded and f- driven in like capital d driven the whole shakespearean thing of like um ambition is what will be your downfall that i don't think he could ever cross into antagonist territory for me at least because i'm like he seems too singularly focused i may have just talked myself out of it actually um (laughs) well because the whole ozymandias thing of like Ozymandias specifically like Watchmen version of like I'm going to do this horrible horrible thing and make myself the villain because it is for the betterment of the world and I'm like I think there's something to that for Henry Higgins of like I am so single minded I think what I'm doing is right to the point where I am irrevocably ruining someone's life and in the world of cyberpunk red that then extends to irrevocably ruining the world well and yeah i think it's it's he has a structural position both in you know his social class and position in society and also in the like things that he is doing that are maybe at odds with the you know level of charisma he has maybe his deep down humanity and you know ultimately like henry higgins does have to be kind of a likable character because you're watching for the whole fucking play right like (laughs) you gotta like the guy even though he's kind of a dick um and he is at odds with eliza just sort of by nature and i mean you know thinking of thinking of george bernard shaw as like also a uh, like you know irish sort of socialist like he is thinking about the class dynamics he is thinking about the like you know there is (laughs) <laughs> there is both like the relationship, but then there is the class relationship between these characters, and those can be at odds with each other. And I think that's huge in cyberpunk is that the relationship of the position that you have in the narrative is sometimes going to be at odds with something with with the actual you know human relationship you have with a character. Yeah, and I, I haven't played the game so I, I i can't speak to this directly but it seems like the sort of game that is open to characters having sort of oppositional yeah goals or or at least maybe not directly oppositional but certainly all the narratives that they weave throughout the book because there's a lot of kind of short stories woven into the core rule book include like characters who are like fuck this guy but also we're working together <laughs> just like this one more time yeah yeah I need money from yeah, this exactly. person. There's so many sort of, it gives you so many reasons beyond like, I enjoy working with this person and we have a, we have a bond that, that drives us. That is common. I think to so many other TTRPGs where it, no, there's like so many and you are, I think, yeah. Encouraged as a player to sort of find material reasons like money or like needing a resource or like owing someone a favor or something that drives your cooperation with each other. I mean, you might be tasked to put down like a rebellion, right? Like, and that's the sort of a classic, like you have to make a capital C choice if your character is asked to do something that is immoral. That's, there's like a whole <laughs> list. <laughs> Was that breaking? I'm so sorry. Oh. <laughs> no, we love it. Um, there's like a whole list in the book for in like the GMing section of like, I think they call them beats. They call, they have like some term for them that is an unnecessary thing to have a special term for. Um, but like all of these sort of potential like outcomes of an encounter that a play that a player character might have, and they're all like weird ways of like fucking someone over for succeeding at the quest that you set them. <laughs> like the vibe of the game is very oppositional. Yeah. I mean, I think a great way to end a game is to make the players destroy themselves. Like, you know, 
you're not going to do the thing that would keep the game going forever. You're going to do the thing that's the right thing to do. I think the choice, the like presentation of the choice that you've proposed for like the end of this game where it's like, do you stay with Henry Higgins or no after he's like given you all of this, but also ruined your life is fascinating and like would be a very juicy ending for a tabletop campaign. Yeah. I had a, one thing we talked about a little bit off mic before we got started is that like the Netrunner is kind of a staple of the cyberpunk genre and there's a fair amount of it in, you know, the book. But with the exception of like Percy's pitch, all of us kind of seemed like we were avoiding that piece of cyberpunk. Um, But I had this very last minute thought again of almost like a San Junipero kind of situation of like, what if Eliza's being presented in the like the net version of the world as one thing when she's something else? Um, What does that look like if it's not actually physically modding her body, but modding the way she's presented? So it's still a training, still a, like, you know, linguistics update. But then she gets to, you know, interact at the garden party, which could be some very long acronym. (laughs) Which I did try to acronym earlier and could not. Um, But yeah. um, So there's like like, a... So it's like catfishing almost. Yeah, like what does catfishing look like when it's also crime? Mm, the tagline of our, of our tabletop campaign. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Again, I love that. that is not anything I have fleshed out. That is just a simple, I was like, cause I've been fixating on the idea of like, what would a party look like in this world? Since we kind of started talking about Miss Higgins as the exec. And I was like, but what if she's not? What if she's a net runner? Mm-hmm. And what if she's the one who like gets them into this virtual party? Um, in the like ready player one style of things, or again, San Junipero of, you know, I'm gonna get the door open for myself, but a fake version of me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I I think that's very I think that's very cool, and I I think I don't know. Can anyone tell me? I feel like one of the nice things about the way they've set it up is that you could you could have you have, you could have Mrs. Higgins be a net runner, and the rest of like everybody can participate in stuff on the net, right? Like that's a pretty standard. If if they have the the mods to plug in. Right. Yeah, that that felt very opaque to me. But yeah, I think I think if you're not a net runner, like you're not contending with black ice or hazardous programs, and you're not like stealing data from anybody else. But you can like go to a party. I'm sure you can plug into the net. You would just need the like you you need a a a, an implant somewhere. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, I got Charlie the acronym. <laughs> the acronym? Yeah, I got the acronym. Please, please read this aloud, Ben. Galvanic Artificial Rhetorical Device Network Project and Recursive Time Y Combinator. <laughs> <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> so Absolutely. that's what they are. That is what they are going to in in this uh, primarily net-based. I guess. <laughs> that's yeah, where, yeah. yeah, that's where Eliza has to prove herself. Yep. Go back or if you know, rhetorical device network. I love that you snuck rhetorical device in there. Yeah, that's pretty good. Mm-hmm. Um, any great. closing any closing thoughts about this kit bash? Particularly, does anyone have a title proposal? So the joking see. one that I thought of earlier was my fair blady after Blade Runner. <laughs> it's terrible. Please do not use that. <laughs> but uh that was what I was like when I was trying to think of when I was like Okay, what are some famous cyberpunk stories? Blade Runner, My Fair Blady. I keep calling it My Fair Cyber Lady, and I feel I like mean, I cyber, like Cyber Lady Pygmalion more. is the easier portmanteau, I think. Is that mm. the right one, portmanteau? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, Cyber Pygmalion. I named my audio file My Fair Cyber Psycho. 
<laughs> Ooh, what uh this is uh, I don't know, this is not very good. Now I'm looking at the song titles and I'm like, what about with a little bit of chrome? <laughs> <laughs> I could have jacked into the net all night. I could have <laughs> Thank you for not saying I could have jacked all night. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did almost name it. I could have hacked all night. <laughs> oh, there I we go. Could, I could have hacked all night. Is much better. That's that's much better. <laughs> okay, I think. I all right, I, those are all options. I've uh, got lots of options on the table. Well, thanks, thanks to everyone uh, for joining us for this skip bash. Before we go, uh, as is tradition, we're going to roll to determine what next month's episode is going to be. And Percy, I believe you wanted to do the honors this time around. I've got it. So we'll roll for play first. Uh, that's a seventeen, which is "Death of a Salesman" by Arthur Miller. Ooh, okay, okay, okay. classic of high school English classrooms. In Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. <laughs> Chris has to be on. Chris will Chris will lose his mind if he's not on this one. Wow. We really took the most milk toast playwright <laughs> and the most milk toast system. And so let's put them together. I'm gonna well, say uh, something. Those those two things do not work together. So <laughs> I'm very excited by that because I feel like so far we've the dice have given us not not softballs, but like things where I was pretty quickly like, I can see a way to do this. So I'm excited for that to not to happen this. at all. <laughs> see the tragedy of the common man with epic heroes. <laughs> we'll I, find out. I do also want to name that the number that I, the deity 5e is a natural one on our table. Yes. So I did I did roll a one. <laughs> yes, yes. Well now we'll do D D five E. I think it's it just listed in the order of what we thought of, right? Like it is I'm I, not sure I did I did list the first ones in the order of what we've done on the podcast. Oh, that's true. That's why that's I was gonna say uh, the natural one on the playlist is Oleana, which I believe is deliberate. That is intentional. <laughs> <laughs> um so well we thanks for do, we need to do Oleana X Wander Home. <laughs> Please stop. <laughs> It's, it just keeps becoming more possible as we eliminate other choices from both lists. Uh, well, thanks again for joining us, everybody. Uh, next, Tune in next month, and we'll, you'll hear us smash together Death of a Salesman and Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. See you then. <laughs> oh, boy. You've been listening to Skip Bash, a part of Dungeons & Drama Nerds Rehearsal Reports. This episode featured Ben Ferber, Percival Hornack, Tess Huth, and Nick Orvis, and was edited by Percival Hornack. Our theme music is Exit the Premises by Kevin McLeod, which is licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0 license. You can find the link in the show notes. Our logo was designed by Todd Brian Backus. We're continuing to dive into the intersection of theater and tabletop role-playing games thanks to patrons like you, so thanks for your support. Join us next month for another Skip Bash.